Hi everybody, it's Andrew Hutchings here, and this video is about how I learned biology, pharmacology, chemical stuff. Uh, yeah. So, most people, I would say, just go to school, they take their classes, they memorize what they need to for their tests, and whatever they remember after that is what they know about topics that that can mean that there's very little actual understanding well personally how the reason I have a very good understanding of the human body and its interactions and everything is because I have a genuine interest in it and pretty much as far back as when I first got a computer when I was like 13 years old uh, I was fascinated by the human, at the time more so the human brain, and I would, well, years before this, I was interested in psychology, and actually I think I was using, somehow I was learning, maybe I was using like one of my parents' computers, but basically once I had my own laptop, I would read medical studies and scientific studies every single day. And I also found, well, okay, I'll actually, I'll get to this in a better order. So when I would go through these medical studies or scientific studies, when I came upon something I didn't know, whether it was a word or it was a receptor or it was a molecule, I would look into it and I would learn everything I could about it. Obviously, if it's a word, you just look it up and you just see the definition, and that's that. If it's a receptor, though, I would look into it, read about what it supposedly does, but then what I like to do is I like to look at drugs that affect how that receptor mo modulates things. So I would look at like the agonists for it and the antagonists for it, and I would read up on all those drugs, and I would see what those drugs tend to do. That way you get to learn what actually happens when that receptor is blocked versus when it's agonized. Um, and then on top of that, what I would do is I would look for websites, whether it be people talking about legal medications are taking or illegal, I don't care. I would find people talking about taking those medications that affect those receptors that I was learning about. So let's just say it was the dopamine receptor. I mean, that was probably one of the very first ones I learned about. So you'd be reading a paper, you go, dope, oh, what's, what's that dopamine receptor, what, or dopamine? I, I don't know how it's going to be mentioned in the paper, but you come across it somehow. What I would do is then I would go type in dopamine, read a bit about it, go on Wikipedia, read everything there about it. Then I would, usually there was like a list of agonists and antagonists, and if there wasn't, I would simply Google it. <clears throat> then I would click on those, and I would go through a lot of them, and I'd read about them. But then I would go back on the internet and I would search for people who actually took those drugs and I could read about their actual experience with them. And the best was when you could find people that actually like gave really good detailed descriptions like, oh, I noticed vasoconstriction, like my blood vessels were tightened, clammy skin, um, you know, genitalia was tight, um, quick thinking. It was nice to get to see what that pharmacology that you read about on paper actually translates into in real life. Even though you can read about what it supposedly does, there's a big difference between reading about the documented effects and reading people's actual experiences with it. Of course those documented effects come from a compilation of people's experiences, but I still like to get it on every level. So you're reading about the receptor itself, reading about the natural ligand of the receptor, the natural molecule that turns it on or off or whatever, and then reading about all the different drugs that agonize it or antagonize it or block it or whatever. And then reading about people who have actually taken those drugs. Um, because I was interested in the brain at first, I was learning a lot about in my early days, like when I was 13, 14, um, maybe even that, until I was 15, but like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, um, yeah, those are the main, a uh, little bit of 
acetylcholine, but not much. Uh, mostly dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and like uh, the transport proteins and the reuptake proteins and all the stuff that had to do with those three big ones. And those three big neurochemicals tend to be affected by illicit drugs. So I would actually go on the forums where people would talk about using illegal drugs. And believe it or not, there are some intelligent people who use illegal drugs and they document the effects very well. They document the change in their heart rate, their blood pressure. Some guys even supposedly worked in labs and had access to things that could measure cranial pressure. I remember reading that one guy accidentally got a contaminated batch of something he wasn't feeling well, and luckily he said he had access to, I don't know the name of the machine that measures cranial pressure, and it turned out he had really high cranial pressure. And I don't remember exactly what he did after that, but yeah, there, it wasn't just a bunch of morons, ooh, I got high, I ran around the block five times, no. I like to read the stuff that gave me meaningful information, but even if it wasn't super technical, it's still nice to hear what it did. It's nice to match the receptor with the drug with its actual effect on the people. I mean, optimally, you could even take those different drugs yourself to know firsthand what it feels like when those various receptors are altered in certain ways. That way you can match. I mean, if you had, it'd be awesome if you had selective agonists, selective antagonists. But by the way, usually when things say selective, they're not truly selective. Some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. But it would be awesome if you could selectively feel what subtype dopamine receptor agonism feels like and read about it on paper. Um, but yeah, I did multi-level learning. So every day, like when I was in high school, for all my years in high school, every morning I had like the same routine. I'd open up my computer and I would read medical studies or I would read these drug forums where people were taking what we call, they called research chemicals at the time. Um, Regardless of what I was reading at the end of the day, it was to learn more pharmacology and drugs effects on the human body, which at the end of the day teaches you about the different receptors in the body and the different proteins and enzymes and everything. <laughs> so yeah, I would wake up every morning and that's what I would do for like 15, 20 minutes before school. And then I got home from school and that's probably, I think that was the first thing I did every day when I got home from school. So I opened my computer back up again and be reading more. And it was all interconnected. I, mean, I explained how it is all interconnected, so I hope you understand that. Um, so yeah, as anything I would come across that I didn't know much about or didn't know anything about, I would look up. Like remember I said, if there was even a word I didn't know, you gotta look it up, you gotta know what it means. That way when you read a paper in the future, you don't get stuck there. You gotta be able to be fluent in scientific language, and anytime there's a receptor mentioned, look into it. Anytime they do a certain type of test to determine something, that, that was really nice, is getting to learn about the different techniques of doing tests. But also it was nice to see their logic uh, trains. Now, I'm at the point now where I can realize that just because somebody got their paper published doesn't mean they necessarily have the, the best logic, but it's still good, especially if you're just starting out, to try to understand the logical patterns of thought that they go through to design the tests and to what the conclusions they come to, how they come to them and such. And also, you're not always going to find information directly. Like say you wanted to find out if, I'll just make up something, if cat causes oxidative damage to the iPhone charger cord protein. Um, maybe there's nothing on it, but maybe you know that cat causes meow, and then you start looking at meow, and it turns out that meow causes this kind of reaction over here, but that kind of reaction over here and other things has been shown to cause oxidative damage. 
of similar things to iPhone charging protein. Uh, so you gotta, not everything's gonna be straightforward. You gotta be able to figure things out. I did a lot, a lot, a lot of that because I was very interested in things and I wasn't gonna stop just because I couldn't find a study that was directly on something. And often, it's not like you're gonna go to the conclusions and learn it from there. Like, what I would typically do is go through their, like what they were actually doing in the study, their procedures, and look for things in there that they didn't even think were important to mention for their study, but, but it actually is important for something else, of an, an entirely different something. Because you can get a lot of data from an experiment but it's not necessarily all important for your experiment, but by looking at all the testing and results, you can maybe figure out something for something else. <laughs> and so yeah, every day, and it wasn't just for like 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes when I got back, when I would finish my schoolwork and stuff, I would spend even more time. I mean, oftentimes I'd spend hours a day going, reading this kind of stuff. And then on top of that, I took normal high school chemistry and biology. I can't remember if I didn't, I don't remember for sure if I took normal biology. I think I just skipped normal biology, but I took normal, I learned like the elementary school sciences, of course. And then in high school, I took normal chemistry, but then my sophomore year of high school, I took AP chemistry which I loved and which I got straight A's in because I was on top of everything. It just made a lot of sense to me. I loved how it improved my understanding of the physical world and how it works. And after AP chemistry, I took AP biology and I was also studying organic chemistry on my own. And um, yeah, the combination of reading medical studies and scientific studies and anecdotal reports and looking into every single thing you don't already know and trying to put everything together while getting a formal education, it does a hell of a lot better than just going to school and memorizing for your tests. <laughs> and so yeah, by the time I had finished high school, I mean, even before I had finished high school, I mean, yeah, before, I, by the time I was in my junior year of high school, I had taken the equivalent of like normal beginner college biology and chemistry, plus I had studied organic chemistry on my own, and I knew a ton of biology and pharmacology because I was reading about it every single day for hours a day for years. So when I got to university, I had probably already read like 10,000 scientific papers. I mean, let's just say I read three per day um, for four years, so roughly. So it's not 10,000, but uh, I probably read more than three per day. So let's say, I'm just trying to be conservative. But let's say four years, Okay, so maybe I didn't read 10,000, but I'm also probably severely undercutting how many I read per day. Um, but let's just be conservative and go with at, at least 3,000 scientific medical papers before I even got into university. In all likelihood, I read closer to 10,000. And it's insane because at my university, they have classes for students right before they're going to graduate that teach them how to read a scientific paper for the first time in their life. That means that they never had any interest to do it on their own for their whole life until this point. And even now, they have to take a class because they don't want to just do, learn and do it on their own. That's insane. It means that you don't actually have an interest in science. If you had an interest in science, by the time you're finishing university, you should have read like 30,000 scientific papers, or at least 10,000 or 5,000 or 
I've, cer I've certainly read probably about 20,000 to date. I know I've read over 10,000 by now for sure. You see why I chose cat protein and like meow and because my cat was over here in case you couldn't hear. <clears throat> Getting a little bit sick also, but not much. Um, yeah, so just constantly every single day because I liked it and enjoyed it and wanted to learn more, I learned. And then I also studied organic chemistry on my own when I was in high school. And I, uh, yeah, I studied the techniques that I saw in these scientific and medical studies. Uh, I read all the anecdotal reports. So, yeah, that's kind of it. And then I went to university and sadly university actually sent me back because when I got to university, I couldn't just go to like advanced organic chemistry and take off start where I left off. I had to go back to general chemistry and do general chemistry again. And I also had some severe injuries and I had other health problems going on with organs and my life was turned upside down. So I didn't really have enough time to keep learning on my own outside of school. And I was struggling just to get through, I mean, I was struggling to stay alive. I was struggling to get through school too. Um, but yeah, school, it certainly, it would have been better if I could have just began at, like, advanced organic chemistry and maybe start biology-wise at, I don't know, because, I mean, I, after general biology, as I would call it, we kind of just took classes that were all over the place. So I guess just start with the classes that are all over the place. Uh, what's a shame is that in university they teach you biochemistry, um, but they don't teach you biochemistry. They just teach you like citric acid cycle and all these different cycles of things, which yes, technically that's biochemistry that goes on in the human body. But there's a big gigantic difference between memorizing some pathways and actually understanding biochemical processes. Because if you need to know about that pathway, you can just Google it and look at it and then use your brain to figure out things about it. Of course, it's very helpful to have everything memorized so that you don't have to Google and you can just be thinking about it yourself. That's why I do a lot better than a lot of people because I already have a gigantic, vast understanding that's all in my brain. But I, it, I just don't like how universities teach the beginner level biochemistry courses because they don't teach you good stuff. They just you have, have you memorize a bunch of pathways and stuff, which is good, but it's also like in the 20,000 medical studies I've read, how many times have, have has somebody had a problem with their Krebs cycle? I don't think I've read a single medical study ever, perhaps, where somebody, the issue turned out to be their citric acid cycle had some problem with it. Now, I'm sure there was one in there somewhere. I don't remember it, but yeah, it's like, those come up so rarely in the science that most any scientist is going to do or medicine that a doctor is going to do that it's like yeah they're crucial to our living they're at the core of how our bodies work you should know about them but there's a lot more important stuff you should be learning about not focusing for months memorizing a bunch of circular pathways and Spend a week on them, learn about them, go, oh yeah, this is the pathway that generates energy in the body. You can see it goes through all these intermediates, blah, 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 blah. If you want to know more about it someday, look into it on your own. If it comes up and there's something, now you know what to go back to. But there's no point in becoming an expert on the circular pathways because it's, there's more important things you can do. But what's really important is 
I was telling someone the other day, you gotta master general chemistry. It may seem like one of the least important subjects for understanding biological sciences, but general chemistry is actually what gives you the foundation for understanding the physical world around, and physics, of course, the physical world around you and the biological processes, because they're all governed by chemical principles. For example, early on you should realize that nothing exists in like one single state or place or form. Everything is constantly moving. So when you have like an atom and it has its electrons, it's not that it has, or let's say you have a molecule. Um, say you have a, a chlorobenzene. It's not that you have all these electrons around the chlorine and then you got these ones around the benzene and they're just like over here and these ones are over here. They're just all going like this, but more of the time they're around the chlorine then they are like a, a larger amount of them is around the chlorine a larger amount of time than it is around the benzene. I'm actually thinking about that for a second because I'm thinking if there's some... Because even though I am an expert on all this, I have, haven't have um, done organic chemistry type stuff in a few years now just because it hasn't been super relevant to my life. So I'm trying to double check and make sure there's not a, something that's going on there that I'm... It's not that I'm overlooking it, it's just that I'm making sure I didn't make a mistake about it. something I'm thinking about. Okay, well, since I can't remember for sure, that example still works completely fine for the point I'm trying to say, but let's pretend that it's a hexane ring instead of a benzene ring. Uh, that way no one can say that, oh, I don't know anything about chemistry because there is one exception to a halogen rule that I won't get into. Um, yeah. And there's things like hydrogen bonding, for example, bonding in general. People tend to look at it like there's this kind of bond and there's this kind of bond and this one's this strong and this kind is this strong. It, it, stop seeing them all as separate. They're all the same. I mean, they're not all the same, but they're all the same at the end of the day. Anytime you have more electron density, meaning that there's more electrons more of the time here than there are here. I don't know why it's slower, but like you have more of them more of the time here versus over here or you have, you have like a deficiency here and you've got excess here, you get bonding. Uh, saying it's a hydrogen bond versus an ionic bond is kind of arbitrary in a way. It just name, it's a, a naming convention. At the end of the day, it just comes down to the electrons want to be in a way so that they can all be equally spread out and happy and sharing the most. Well, I mean, some atoms pull more of the electrons than others, but the total system wants to come together to bring it so that they're like the mo Sorry, my cat's annoying me with this scratching. Because she went in the other room. So, any, and, uh, to just be more simple because I already tried to explain to you how it's, and actually it's not the point of the video to explain chemistry to you, but like, it's not just that there's these electrons here, these here, they're all moving around constantly. They're just, it, they're over there more often than they're over here or whatever. Um, but bonding, to bring it back to a more traditional view, if you have a plus and a minus, they come together. That's a bond. Forget about whether it's a hydrogen bond or an ionic bond, just look at how strong that plus is and how strong that minus is tells you pretty much how strong the bond is going to be.
Yeah. Uh, but to get back on the topic of this video, where was I? Like at university. So yeah, then through university, um, too bad I had to repeat general chemistry and then I had to go through organic chemistry again, but also I had a lot of health issues and I could barely get through school. I had to withdraw from my university twice actually. Uh, but yeah, then on top of all my self-learning, I have a university education in biochemistry and molecular biology. Originally I was getting a degree in chemistry as I brought up, I had a lot of health problems and issues and stuff, and I was barely surviving, let alone getting through school. So I um, didn't do so good in school for a while. Um, like my GPA got down to a 1.7. And what do you expect when you're trying to just stay alive? And it's hard enough to do, hard enough to stay alive when you have a whole bunch of met in stuff uh, yeah uh, so I didn't do too well in school but I, I stayed in school I was good and um, yeah, what was I gonna say sorry bringing up that just kind of distracted me from what I was talking about but actually, I finally graduated just a couple days ago. And I'm proud of myself because as I explained to you, I had to leave my university twice because of health issues. Luckily, I'm healthy now, I'm good. Um, yeah, it's great to be alive. And also, I, I wanna make a video on this that people don't realize that there's so much, so much stuff in life that doesn't matter, that they get stressed out over. At the end of the day, what matters is that you're alive, you're healthy, and you have your family, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, and then after I got healthy again, I once again could have enough time to learn on my own and learn in my university. And I've taken a variety of the more advanced classes. Actually, I'm really glad that they have more advanced classes uh, grade-wise because the, the harder classes helped me to get my grades back up a lot more than the easier classes because the easier classes, everyone just cheats or they go on Google. I mean, usually people cheat by communicating with each other. To be, I've actually never cheated. It may sound crazy, but I've never cheated. I, I didn't need to cheat, didn't want to cheat, didn't want to risk it, but I, I didn't need to. I, I, why, would I, why would I want to hear somebody else's if I'm already, not to be narcissistic, but the best in the class? So once I got to the harder classes that people couldn't cheat on or couldn't cheat nearly as easily and that you couldn't find answers on the internet and stuff, it was a lot easier. Well, I mean, I always got pretty good grades, but it was a lot harder for everybody else to get the good grades, meaning that the curve brought me up even higher. Because when everybody can cheat and get high grades, they can, I mean, if they just buy a membership to online subscriptions, they can get 100% while you're getting like a 90%. And then that brings you down even lower because then 100% becomes the average and then you, it sucks, but yeah. Luckily this last year, all my classes for the most, yeah, all my classes were advanced. I did way better than I usually do because as I explained to you, everyone else did worse because they couldn't cheat as much. Trust me, they still cheated. It just was a lot harder for them. Um, sadly, I don't know a single person who doesn't cheat. It's crazy. It's like, oh, why don't you just pick something you actually like to learn in school and that you want to be good at and learn it instead of just going to school, cheating, and passing tests just to get a degree. So yeah, I am self-taught and I have a formal education that began in high school and continued through university. And now I am probably off to medical school, but I hope I'll be able to work as a scientist, hopefully at a pharmaceutical or biotech company while I'm in medical school. I know it's going to be difficult time-wise, um, but if I can find a part-time job doing that, I would love to and try to fit it in. Uh, if I can't, I would like to work as a scientist at a hospital part-time while in medical school. 
And sorry, I'm getting tired of talking, so I'm gonna end the video here. But yes, that is how I came to be where I am with, uh, to sum it all up, just genuine interest. So I've always been learning about it in lots of my free time, plus a formal education in it. You can hire me for training advice, coaching advice, uh, <laughs> training advice. See, I'm tired and hungry and thirsty and stuff, and I yeah, wasn't feeling too good today. Uh, let's see, you can hire me for training, advice, consultations, plans, etc. Coaching, all of that stuff too. Diet, all that stuff too. Not medical advice, but you can hire me to consolidate medical information, put it all in one place, along with my opinion. That way you can make the most well-informed decisions for your health. You can also hire me to tutor you in sciences. Um, I can tutor pretty much all the sciences, but I prefer the ones that have to do with molecular interactions because that's what I'm really good at and good at explaining. Um, more biology than you may realize has to do with molecular interactions, so don't think that I'm not talking about biology. Um, but I probably wouldn't want to tutor like general biology, and I wouldn't want to tutor calculus because I haven't done that in a long time. Um, wouldn't want to tutor very much physics because I haven't done that in a long time either. Uh, even though I got the highest grade in AP physics in my entire high school, despite having health issues starting halfway through that year. Because it was my senior year of high school. But yeah, um, all the different chemistries and biological sciences and stuff, I can probably tutor you in really well, and I'm really good at explaining this stuff. Apparently better than PhD people. Um, I have tutored people in these things since I was like 15 or 16. I've tutored nursing students since I was 16. Um, I tutored university students in organic chemistry since I was like 16, maybe 17, but I think 16. So yeah, I'm really good at explaining this stuff. My, oh, my website is andrewhutchings.org. My Instagram is natural underscore true underscore fitness. Oh, and please like, subscribe, and comment. Check out my other videos. I've got like 250, and I uh, need to do stuff to make myself feel better now.